I did want to say a huge thank you to Venice, Trixie, uh, Ruby, Ruth, the various people who were involved in um, organising this. I think it was absolutely stunning that they went from losing a venue really quite late yesterday evening to coming up with this absolutely superb one um, within a day. So if you're ever having... <laughs> Just think if you're, if you're ever having any sort of like parties or special occasions, I know who I'm going to be going to in the future. And you even have some accompanying cheerleaders outside, which is laid on at no, ex at no extra cost whatsoever. Um, so it's going to be myself speaking, Miranda Yardley speaking, but we do want this to be as interactive as possible. I'm not sure if we have um, the all night tubes on the, what night is it? Tuesday or Wednesday? Wednesday? What day is it? Wednesday. I don't know, maybe the Victoria line. Those of you who might want to stay late will probably get booted out of here uh, before that. Uh, so I'm going to get on with things. I just did want to um, acknowledge before I begin, um, not just a big thank you to the organisers, but I also just want to give a particular acknowledgement to my dear friend Jackie Means, who gifted me this uh, rather uh, um, attractive t-shirt, which I uh, really appreciate from her, because it was observed once upon a time that it was bang out of order to say that a trans woman is, ma is a man. So I appreciate that. It's a real shame that Jackie can't be here. I also want to give her credit, because a lot of the material in my slides actually comes uh, straight from her, well, her Facebook wall, basically. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be quite as funny here as it was when it originally appeared on her Facebook wall, but thanks, Jackie. So, I've given it a really boring title, um, What is Gender, from the GRA to that I thought, that's nice and boring in case, in case we were all a bit overexcited by all the events and all the, you know, whatever's been going on, fun and games. So I thought, oh, this will, you know, make everyone all calm down and you know, take a few deep breaths. I will try to make it less boring than it looks on there. Obviously that's saying from the Gender Rec Recognition Act 2004 to this proposed uh, Gender Recognition Bill. Um, or is it called the Gender Identity Bill? I might have got that wrong actually. Anyway, whatever it's gonna be, it's all kind of made up language, doesn't really matter that much in uh, 2017. So, to begin, in our secret location near Speaker's Corner where we're um, filming this, um, I just wanted to say, probably some of you might have been following this a lot more than I've been, um, but there has been uh, you know, some quite lively and, um, commentary and uh, accompanying uh, observations and even accusations uh, about this meeting on social media, which I haven't followed that closely myself. But one thing that I did notice on there, because you know you tend to, if it's got your own name in it, it tends to jump out a little bit. So I did notice that on a couple, by a couple of you know, these characters, I was, um, it was claimed that I was a notorious transphobe. So I was quite, um, I was quite flattered because I really haven't done that much, certainly, you know, particularly recently, I think, to earn such a, an accolade. So I thought, oh, well, that kind of gives me something to live up to, really. So I'm going to try and do that um, because um, I thought I don't want it to be like credit where it's not due. So I'll try and uh, live up to that accolade in the first, um, first few slides of mine. So I thought, well... One of the most transphobic things, or probably the most transphobic thing that we can do, obviously that word transphobic is a nonsense, meaningless word, but the thing that seems to um, evoke that, uh, that kind of accusation most often is simply by naming a man as a man. That's, that's quite, a, I would have thought, well, you know, once upon a time, it's quite an innocent observation, and that seems to be what gets you this uh, label of transphobe. So I thought, oh, well, let's have a little um, think about some of these men who claim to be women, and just go through and, um, and name them as men, and see what light that sheds on this situation once we actually start naming men as men. So I've got quite a colourful um, uh, colourful parade of um, of men here for you to look at. Um, some of you you'll know, some of you some of them you may not know. So I'm going to whiz through these because it kind of makes the point. I can make the point quite quickly. So this one here is instructing us. This um, was this was, man was once called Bruce Jenner, and now he's instructing us quite um, quite bossily, I think, to um, call him Caitlin, presumably because of um, the various uh, sort of aspects of his appearance that he seems to have embraced here on this cover of Vanity Fair. Here's another man. Um, this man uh, is also um, intent that we call him a woman. This man, um, some of you may know, 
actually tried to strangle his wife when she didn't react too, um, too enthusiastically to his announcement that he was now a woman. Anyway, so there's another man. Here's a man with a nice um, friendly smile and a necklace on. Here, oops, sorry, I pressed the wrong one there. Um, here's a man with a bit of a surprised look on his face. Here's a man um, showing off his nail polish. Um, maybe saying, do you think I can get away with it given the size of my hands? But, um, but yeah, who knows? We could maybe have a caption for a few of these. Um, here's a man in a sparkly dress. Here's a man in a purple top. Here's a man in some sexy underwear. Here's a man doing a sexy pose. Here's another man doing a sexy pose. Uh, here's a man that I would say has spent considerably more than most of them on facial feminization surgery and uh, makeup. Um, here's another man with a surprised look on his face. Here's a very friendly man who wants to be friendly with lesbians. And he's got a nice um, placard there saying, lesbian friends. And that is a very nice friendly gesture from a man who wants to be friends with lesbians. Um, here's a man with a red hairband. Uh, this particular man is a senior lecturer in women's studies in a, a college in America. Um, here's a group of men, um, because sometimes, you know, uh, men do kind of, you know, stand around in groups. One of the men in this uh, picture has got a police outfit, a police uniform on, and the others haven't. Um, here's a man with a bit of a, I don't know, slightly scary look on his face. Um, here's a man with a little clutch bag. Um, here's a man who is... Uh, the first transgender TV news reporter um, called Zoe Tur, who I seem to remember on a chat show threatening um, another man with violence. But anyway, we've got a few firsts coming up for you because we've got Zoe Tur, who is the first uh, transgender uh, TV news reporter who is a man. And then we've got this man, who is the first um, uh, female transgender male man judge in the high court but anyway he's a man and he's managed to do that um by obviously wearing a variation of the wig and frock that some of his other um uh trans identified men um men wear so he's a man who's the first uh, transgender uh supposed woman uh, at the um uh in judge in the high court um here's another first this is india willoughby another uh, a man who is the first transgender um, woman, supposedly, on Loose Women. Um, here's another man who hasn't really put very much effort into it at all, um, because this is actually the first, um, the first female man, amazingly enough, the first female uh, man, and I didn't want to mention the man bit in most of the reports, who is serving in the British infantry. So, um, so I can't remember his name, but it was, on, it was on the front page of several newspapers, including The Sun, actually, as I recall. First, um, first female soldier in the British infantry. There he is, looking quite pleased with himself. You can't see it on the screen, but if you look very closely, he has got a little pair of earrings on. So that is maybe what is signifying um, that he's now a woman. But he hasn't obviously put as much effort into his um, womanly, so-called womanly appearance as some of the others. And neither has this man, who has <laughs> put um, really very little effort into it at all in this particular picture. This man, interestingly, has kind of um, is put a little bit of effort in, because he's got a few bangles and he's got a bit of eyeliner, but he's also... Um, um, hasn't bothered to go for the full, um, you know, hair removal that, that so many um, men claiming to be women do. Um, but he is obviously doing, by doing that, he is expanding the bandwidth of what it means to be a woman, which, considering he's a man, is actually, you know, quite a clever thing to do. So I think we're all impressed with him. Um, here's a man who is really not very nice at all. This is uh, Robert Kosilek, who garroted his wife. He murdered his wife. Um, garroting her to the extent that he actually almost decapitated her and then whilst in prison he decided that he's Michelle and then he was insisting on um, so-called gender reassignment or as we now roguishly say gender confirmation surgery. So um, oh I see the cheerleaders are still um, doing a good old job there. Um, so we're often told that these kinds of things never happen um, in terms of uh, uh, men claiming to be women also being um, being extremely violent. So I just want to go through this uh, particular slide. We've got at the, um, at the top there, we've got Paul, um, actually, uh, where's my bag? I've got my, note, I've got my notes about these. I, I'll have to try and remember um, the various violent crimes that they all committed. Um, at the top there, we've got 
Um, we've got Paul Wayne Luck, uh, Luckman, who I believe now prefers to be called Nicole, who was um, a convicted child torturer and child murderer. Um, we've got another child torturer and murderer there, Critsy King. Um, we've got Dana McCallum here. Some of you may know this is quite a famous case. Dana McCallum is, um, was a Twitter engineer who raped his wife. Um, this is quite a recent case here of uh, Donna Perry, who is a... Um, who was complimented by the judge when he was recently convicted for the uh, murder of three women, so a serial murder of women, and he was complimented by the judge for the, his, the dignity that he displayed at his trial. So that's, um, that's very nice. Uh, then we've got Christopher Hanbrook, who prefer, prefers to be called Jessica, who in uh, Toronto entered two women's, sheltered, two women's shelters and managed to um, sexually assault uh, uh, women in each of those. Um, down here we've got another um, another serial killer who um, and it would be rather nice wouldn't it rather refreshing if some of the crowd out there might turn their attention to the likes of these individuals rather than to those of us who are actually trying to name them and be clear about naming them in this very hostile um, situation so anyway this is um, this is Paul Denyer, who now likes to be who now likes to be called Paula. He's another uh, serial killer of, wi of women. He murdered three women, and here we have Davina Ayrton, who um, uh, who raped a 15-year-old girl. So there we are. There's no shortage of these examples, but those were just a few men that I thought um, it would be quite important to name. Here's another man who's looking extremely pleased with life because he's just been told that he hasn't got to serve a, pr a prison sentence for possession of extreme animal pornography. He's also probably looking so pleased because he wasn't mentioned even as a so-called transgender woman in the newspaper report about him. He was just um, mentioned, he was just reported as Wendy Jones, a woman, who, um, who was in possession of extreme animal pornography. So obviously these kinds of reports, where we used to see reports in, uh, um, about uh, violent men who also uh, claim to be women, we used to at least see some reference to them being transgender, and that is gradually, you can see there's quite a pattern now, where that is gradually either not being mentioned at all, probably due to the new um, the government guidelines and the recommendations in the Miller report, um, uh, that's that's it's kind of much um, harder to actually find uh, a, a, um, reporting that they are in fact uh, so-called transgender. Um, this one admittedly isn't a picture of a man, but it's a picture of um, of an article in Pink News where Pink News were extremely outraged that this particular man, who was a convicted rapist, who was placed in a women-only jail. Had to, had had to be segregated because he'd made unwanted uh, sexual advances to inmates, and what um, and what the pink what pink news were particularly or um, sort of singularly outraged about was the this news coverage from the Daily Mail where they mentioned the fact that he had a penis, they mentioned the fact that he had. Um, being a man, a 50-year-old man, father of three, who then became, uh, who so-called um, became a trans woman uh, whilst in prison. And I would have thought these details were really rather important when we're talking about a convicted male rapist. But anyway, the Pink News chose, uh, chose to be very outraged about that, um, about that report. So that's all a little bit depressing about some of these violent ones. So I thought I'd cheer us up with some cute little baby pictures. Um, <laughs> Uh, and this one here with the Christmas tree and the nice cuddly doll, I thought um, I thought it might cheer us up after all those rather grim grim stories there. So this individual is called Stephanie, which presumably is a play on the name Stephanie and the idea of sitting on someone's knee. And Stephanie not only claims to be a woman, but he claims to be a six-year-old girl. So in fact, he doesn't claim to be a woman; he claims to be a six-year-old child. But he's got good company because this is somebody called Riley, who also um, claims not not simply to be female, but also to be a baby. As you can see, they're wearing um, wearing the nappies. Um, this individual, because they're all getting quite elaborate in their claims now. So this individual, Chloe Jennings White, claims not just to be a man. Uh, sorry, not just to be a woman. Um, but to be a paraplegic. So that's um, a bit of a variety. And this person here, this man, claims not only to be a woman, but claims to be a dragon. <laughs> Female dragon. Um, yeah. 
I said, it gets quite colourful. And I did, re when I was reading up about this individual, in the, um, it was observed, they were observing in the article the different surgery that this person had had done, including apparently having his nose removed, which I did wonder if he's a dragon, where the fire's going to come out from if he's had his nose removed. But presumably, um, they'll probably find some sort of medical procedure to address that as well. And um, last but not least, here are some men who actually think they're puppies as well. So um, obviously no relation to any sort of fetish, BDSM, um, uh, sexual practices at all. They're just innocently embracing their puppy identity. So I just wanted to start with that simple act of naming because that's the sort of thing that we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to say very clearly that these individuals are men and this is, and this is, what, um, this is what they're doing. So why... Um, why are we not supposed to um, name so-called trans women as men? Well, you probably know as much as I, uh, as I do that what we are told, if we attempt to name these men as men, that, um, well, we're told it's quite a circular argument that trans women are women. Kind of, that's it. We're just told that. And if you suggest that maybe they're not, then you get told, like, you're bang out of order, as I was told. But I think to say trans women are women, it kind of it leaves a little bit to be desired. It's not really saying anything. It's a, you know, it's a kind of meaningless um, statement. Um, uh, but you're also subjected to various um, forms of name calling, such as you're transphobic, um, you're a turf, you're a bigot, you're hateful, you're a fascist, you know, all of these kinds of things. Certainly there's been plenty of that in relation to, um, to this event. Uh, tonight. We're also told, and I think these, these things are things that we really need to think about what is going on when we're told that by simply naming a man as a man, that we are making young people kill themselves. Because that is some of the worst emotional blackmail that I have heard. But for any of us who work in the women's sector and have heard the way that abusive men try to control their, their partners, then threats to kill themselves really comes as no surprise. But this has taken on a bit of a different slant because we're are being told that if we name men as men, if we assert our um, right to name reality, that we are contributing to um, children's suicide is a particularly pernicious rhetorical strategy, a manipulative rhetorical strategy of transgender activists. So I think we really need to think about what's going on when they do that. And similarly, in terms of your killing uh, trans women who are women, not men, etc. So we're subjected to all of this kind of thing. We're also subjected to this kind of thing. As I said, they often get called TERFs, transphobes, etc. This is just, I mean, these are a bit old now, so there's been plenty more since, um, since these appeared online. But, you know, this kind of imagery here, have it TERFs with a, a, a huge man um, wielding an axe about to um, chop uh, this woman into bits by the look of it. But we are told that we are violent and we are... Um, we are uh, using hate speech and that we are responsible for deaths when it, the, the amount of um, rhetorical um, violence, uh, hate speech and threats that come from, the, uh, from transgender activists is um, really, uh, really, you need a strong stomach really to read some of this stuff. Um, the quote here is about um, how we all need to have our uh, throats slit one by one, etc. So it really is quite indistinguishable from the kinds of online misogyny we see from the old-fashioned kind of men who wear trousers. Um, it, it doesn't look really very different when it comes from um, men in dresses either. So why... Um, uh, why am I quite intent on naming, and hopefully uh, many of you are too, or all of you are too, why is it important that we name men as men? Well, I um, perceive all of those men that were in my little parade there, I perceive them all to be male because of things that seem to me not particularly controversial, seem to me quite reasonable, and seem to me also... Um, the fruits, particularly when we come to the subject of gender, the fruits of several decades of feminist, of, of feminist, um, of scholarship and insight. So, I think it is quite reasonable. God, they really are. I'm going to stand over there. <laughs> I could, just, I could just get the megaphone and open the window and shout back at them, but anyway, I've, I've prepared my talk, so I'll see it through. So, I'm sure that this really is old hat to, um, I'm sure that this really is old hat to uh, most of us here, but I thought it was worth just going back to some really um, fairly uh, sort of uh, key principles. So when we're talking about sex, 
um, we're talking about biological features. There's been reams written. The more nonsense that gets written, the more kind of scholarship needs to be written as to, you know, to kind of um, try and uh, counter it. Um, but I haven't really entered into all of that. I'm just saying that there are certain biological features which designate us either male or female, or, um, which mean that we are uh, recognised as being either male or female in terms of things like anatomy, chromosomes, etc. So when we're talking about sex, we're talking about whether someone is male or female. And so if we're talking about whether someone's ma male, I think it's quite reasonable to then refer to an adult uh, human male as a man and an adult human female as a woman. I don't think that there is anything particularly controversial about that. And I think kind of history is kind of on my side because for, you know, God knows how many centuries or millennia that is, that's kind of been the case. Um, obviously, when we're talking about gender, we're talking about something quite different. We're talking about all the various kinds of social roles, the kinds of expectations, the kind of treatment that we might... Um, we might receive that that is um, uh, that is different according to whether you have a male body or a female body. We are um, we are expected to fulfil different social roles even now, all this time after the second wave women's movement, where it's, it's still those kind of expectations. We're certainly treated very differently, and it's not just it kind of annoys me when people talk about gender as a social construct. So I think that's very wishy washy. It's not just about social construct that just affects men and affects women. It's about relations of power between women and men. Obviously, we do not live in an equal world of power relations between women and men. So gender is about um, cementing and embedding and in, uh, maintaining and uh, reproducing the particular uh, power relations between men, women and men. Because if you think about it for more than a little while, and some people here have studied this for absolutely years, when we think about masculinity, what we're thinking about are all the kind of behaviours, so-called um, attributes, maybe styles of clothing, certainly status, position, um, a sense of uh, potential and possibility in terms of uh, your power and what you can achieve. That what we're talking about is a whole collection of things that together form ritualised male domination. That is what masculinity is. It's not an individual gender identity trait. It is um, a set of um, different kind of practices um, and codified uh, behaviours and systems that ritualise male domination. By contrast, um, femininity is ritualised female subordination. And I won't kind of give lots of examples because... Um, they're coming up on the next slide. So why then is it important to make this distinction between sex and gender? And why is it important to name men as men? Naming men as men was such a vital part of the women's liberation movement and, um, and feminist scholarship back in those early days. And there were lots of books that had silence in the title or essays that had silence in the title because it was about women breaking the silences of our own lives and naming who was doing what to whom and then seeing that there were patterns of this, and that was how feminist theory emerged. So it's really crucial to name men as men because that is how we develop an understanding and an analysis of patriarchy. That's how. If we can't name men as men, then we can't name patterns of male violence, we can't name who is in control. So naming men as men then enables to answer these kinds of questions. Who controls economic, social, political and cultural systems in institutions? In whose, in whose hands does this kind of economic and social and um, political power lay? Well, if we can name men as men, then we can see exactly where it lies. And it also helps us to answer the question, who's doing what to whom? And so, again, over decades, feminists have answered that question in terms of looking at what we know women are subjected to under patriarchal power relations between women and men. Femicide, female infanticide, sex abortion, female genital mutilation, rape, sexual assault, domestic violence, poverty, economic disadvantage, prostitution, pornography, discrimination, objectification. I'm thinking here in particular, well, in addition to all the sex industry, but just the sort of normalised objectification of high heels and makeup and cosmetic surgery and all of this stuff. Illiteracy, there's um, hugely, more, um, hugely more of the world's poor. That, um, and illiterate are women rather than men. Denial of reproductive rights, exploitation of reproductive and domestic labour. I mean, you know, that was just kind of a quick list off the top of my head. Also, historically, we can think about foot binding, and I think we need to think about things like chest binding um, in relation to these practices. And also, of course, witch burning. And we've got a nice little example. Fort uh, fortunately, there, um, fortunately, touch wood, <laughs> um, they uh, haven't gone quite that far yet. But in terms of the uh, kill all turfs, I think there are certainly echoes of um, former um, uh, uh, persecution of women in terms of the current 
Oh, I've gone a bit quiet there. In terms of the current um, persecution by um, by uh, friends outside. So, as Leah Keith says, it is a real mistake, and this is such a kind of um, uh, kind of uh, foundational point of um, of the whole kind of trans activist narrative that gender is a binary or gender is a, s a spectrum, and then you can be non-binary or anywhere along the spectrum. Bender uh, gender is certainly not a binary; it's a hierarchy because it's about cementing those power relations of men on top and women on the bottom, and it is um, the means by which um, those power relations are naturalised, institutionalised and eroticised. So it seems to be natural through things like religious or scientific texts. It's institutionalised through all of these institutions that we can think about. And it's eroticised because it is, a found, um, it is key to heterosexuality as well, that this re relationship of subordination and domination is seen to be somehow um, sort of uh, uh, intrinsically linked to sexual desire and... Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's seen as desirable in that sense. So, um, so as I say then, what gender is, is a political system of male domination and female subordination. That's what it is. I don't think we should use the term gender. I think it would be good to just abandon it. And when we're talking about um, patriarchy, which is what we're talking about, we need to talk about male domination and female subordination. Gender is just a very... Um, uh, unhelpful word that serves to kind of obscure um, obscure the reality of what's going on and to set up other kinds of um, really uh, kind of uh, um, fairly meaningless sort of uh, categories. So it's a means of institutionalising, naturalising and eroticising male supremacy. And what I'm arguing here is that what gender is not is some kind of innate property of the individual, as in the terms like gender identity or gender expression. I just do want to finish with this slide, is to say I recommend uh, Rebecca Riley Cooper's work where she does quite a nice hatchet job on this concept of gender identity. And I want to say that if we accept this, which I think has uh, considerably more logic and reason on its side and things that are kind of like demonstrably true if we accept this then there is no such thing as transgenderism there is no such thing as trans men as trans women as transgenderism as non binaries or any of it it actually doesn't exist so when they are making these claims around transgender equality what is happening sorry Miranda sorry I just can't resist this but um is that we if if we name men as men, we can name their male behaviour and we can see that what they are doing is claiming to be women and that they are demanding recognition rights and access on that totally false premise. And then we can develop a critique of their behaviour, of their male entitlement, their male fantasy and their misogyny. But what they're doing, rather sneakily, is by making these claims around identity, they're moving their behaviour beyond critique. They're, you know, as soon as you say something's my identity, it's, you can't critique it because it's my identity. And I will finish with this one. And as Carla Mandela said in a very prescient um, essay that she wrote, well, back in 2000, she said, identity politics is a stealth manoeuvre that demands in the name of tolerance, but now increasingly in the name of equality, because we don't have to just have, you know, it's about transgender equality, that others do not challenge my politics. So by, by claiming a certain identity, I can then demand that no one... Um, in the name of equality, that no one can challenge my behaviour, no one can challenge my politics, no one can, cl can, cha can challenge what I'm claiming. So that was, a, that was really the key point that I wanted to, um, to make sure that everyone went away with, because it's this that informs that informed the Gender, Re Gender Recognition Act of 2004, <coughs> that informed the Maria Miller um, inquiry, and that is going to inform this, this bill that, that, um, that they're proposing for this autumn. And that's the level that we have to go in at, because it's based on an absolute house of cards. Thank you very much. For <laughs>